Welcome to worship today as we near the end of summer. We're delighted to hear that some of you are inviting friends and families to gather with us online by either sharing a link or inviting them to subscribe to the weekly invitation that we send out each Thursday. I'd like you to consider today some folks you know who might be inspired, encouraged, or challenged by the worship today. Following Pastor Aaron's sermon today, in which he concludes with a great story about a Roman Catholic nun who surprised her students by how she changed their classroom. We have some awesome music offered by college students Sophie and Sam Hankey, a song titled Nothing More. I want you to listen closely to the lyrics while you enjoy our two talented artists and their parents' favorite children. Now, no worries, Max and Maddie, you're still in the top four. Now, even with the unusual return to school this fall, there are still young people who need backpacks, school supplies. So we're going to continue our long-standing tradition of gathering such supplies for youth in need. Hundreds of them every year. Now, you can drop off your donations in the atrium or send a check or make a gift online that is earmarked for those school supplies. And again, please keep up the stellar effort you've had all summer providing food and sundries Support for our sister church, Gethsemane Lutheran, in North Minneapolis. And of course, your congregation here at Mount Calvary thanks you. Every gift is an investment in sharing the gospel and Christ's grace. Hi, we're the Bensons. I'm Patty. And I'm Steve. And this is our Mount Calvary story. Mount Calvary has been a really special part of our family for many years. And initially it was the activities and the opportunities that drew us to the church. And those experiences turned out to be so much more because of the people involved in them. We started out with preschool when the boys were young. And the preschool teachers that we run into today still remember our 21 year old. They're there with purpose and um, authenticity and just a passion for what they do. We realize that that's not a coincidence and it's not accidental, but it really is intentional and it really reflects who Mount Calvary is. Um, I realize now that that is uh, a big part of why this place is so special to us and our family and why we're so proud to be members. Now, we're ready to worship. And wherever you are, whenever you are worshiping, however you are worshiping, we gather as we always do, in the name of the Creator God, our Savior and Spirit. Amen. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 16, starting with verse 13. Jesus went to the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi, where he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Some say John the Baptist, they answered. Others say Elijah, while others say Jeremiah or some other prophet. What about you? He asked them. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus, for this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock foundation, I will build my church, and not e even death will ever be able to overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here ends the reading. Grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asked his followers. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks us again today. Or better yet, who do you see that I am? Close your eyes for a moment. Close them and imagine that Jesus is in front of you. Is the man you see calming the storm Chinese? Is the person glowing with heavenly glory 
Navajo is the person riding into Jerusalem surrounded by cheering crowds, Korean? Is the man sharing the Last Supper with his disciples from Cameroon? Now, when I close my eyes and imagine Jesus, one of the first images that comes to my mind are the two stained glass windows from my home congregation. Jesus stands at the door and knocks, and Jesus the Good Shepherd. And the Jesus that I imagine looks like he's German. He looks just like my home congregation. He looks just like me. But there's a fair chance that when you close your eyes and picture Jesus, you imagine this painting, the most reprinted painting of all time, The Head of Christ by Warner E. Salman, with over a billion copies in circulation. In 1924, Salman's first draft was a charcoal sketch for the youth magazine of his church body, the Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant, a church with Lutheran roots. He wanted to appeal to young adults, so he made Jesus sit down for a school photo, looking very much like the professional photos of the time. He wanted Jesus to be accessible and familiar to the audience. So he kind of made Jesus look like the handsome movie stars of the time. Jesus could have given John Barrymore or Kirk Douglas a run for the money. Solomon's first sketch was so popular, the graduation class of North Park Theological Seminary commissioned a color version. A religious publisher saw it, bought the rights, and the head of Christ icon was born. And this depiction of Jesus as a handsome, Nordic-looking white guy has saturated our American imaginations. So much so that Megyn Kelly could claim Jesus' whiteness was self-evident, just like Santa Claus. Jesus yeah. was a white man too, but you, you know, it's like, we have, he was a historical figure. I mean, that's a verifiable fact, as is Santa. I just want right. the kids watching to know that. Now, this image, the head of Christ, itself is not problematic. Every culture, race, nation, and language should depict Jesus, the Savior of the world, as one of their own. That is what it means for God to be incarnate in human flesh. It means God looks like us, all of us. Jesus, the Son of God, becoming one of us, teaching and healing and feeding and walking beside and eating with us, flesh and blood humans, is what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah, the Savior. In today's reading, when Peter proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah, Peter was right. And Jesus declares, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. But Jesus goes on to further explain who the Messiah is in the following verses. The Messiah, Jesus says, will undergo great suffering and be rejected by the religious establishment and ultimately die, like one of us humans. But Peter gets mad at Jesus for saying this. The Messiah doesn't suffer. The Messiah doesn't die. The Messiah doesn't sacrifice himself. The Messiah dominates. The Messiah triumphs. Jesus, however, doesn't praise Peter this time. In fact, Jesus says he's in league with Satan. Why? Because Peter's mind is on human things. Peter has an image in his mind of who the Messiah is and what the Messiah should be and do and look like. But this image of the Messiah isn't the Messiah. This image of Jesus isn't Jesus. The problems come when the image of Jesus replaces Jesus. And the catastrophe happens when we use this image of Jesus as the white savior to justify enslaving, killing, and exterminating people who don't look like that white image of Jesus. Images of a white Jesus holding the whole world have translated into images of white Europeans seizing the whole world and brutally killing people of color in order to do it. Andrew Jackson was holding an image of a white Jesus when he signed the Indian Removal Act as president of the United States, legalizing ethnic cleansing. In his address to Congress, 
Jackson outlined his case for this Indian Removal Act, playing on the image of who was good and sacred and who was bad and profane. This law will open large tracts of the country to, quote, civilized population now occupied by a few savage hunters. By opening the whole territory to the settlement of whites, it will advance rapidly in population, wealth, and power, unquote. He continues, it will cause the Indians, quote, to cast off their savage habits and become an interesting, civilized, and Christian community, unquote. And then he concludes, quote, what good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic filled with all the blessings of liberty, civilization, and religion, unquote. And so he and other presidents gave the military authority to bring this liberty, civilization, and religion to the Indians at the point of a gun. In a letter to Colonel Henry Sibley, stationed here in St. Paul, Minnesota, dated September 28, 1862, Major General John Pope plainly states the ultimate extension of Jackson's image. Quote, It is my purpose utterly to exterminate the Sioux Indians, destroy everything belonging to them. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts, and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromises can be made." Unquote. Brothers and sisters, how we imagine one another matters. When our Minnesota ancestors imagined the Dakota people as maniacs and wild beasts, people who could not be dialogued nor reasoned with, people who were not sacred but savage, then the only action they could imagine was extermination. These limited images of Jesus have in part limited our imagination of personhood. It has created a world where instead of honoring the full personhood of people of color, every non-white becomes firmly situated in a category of danger that should be avoided, expelled, or destroyed. Our image of heaven is the image we seek to make on earth. And our image of Jesus is the image of sacredness we see on earth. That is one facet of Jesus' declaration from today's scripture. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God gives us real power to bind and release. So how will we use our power? To shackle or to free? One Roman Catholic nun made her choice. Sonari Glinton tells the story of Sister Rosemary, the principal of his Chicago parochial school. She loved her students. Glinton says, quote, she knew every single kid, every parent, everything about each of us mattered, unquote. And Sonari's school was made up of almost all black kids and black families. And one day, while fourth grader Sonari was reading in class, in walks Sister Rosemary. Everyone expected someone to be in big trouble. Good morning, boys and girls, she says. Good morning, Sister Rosemary, the kids sing back. Now, in his classroom, just like in every classroom of St. Philip Neri School, there was a crucifix hanging in the front, a little statue of Jesus hanging on a cross. The crucifix had a blonde wooden cross with a figure of Jesus suspended on it. And Sister Rosemary grabbed a chair, dragged it to the front of the room, climbed up, and then on her tippy toes, reached up and took the crucifix off the wall. And then again on her tippy toes, she reached up and put up a new crucifix. And hanging on this cross was a black Jesus. And she began to leave the room when one courageous classmate spoke up. What are you doing, Sister Rosemary? Glinton continues, quote, Without hesitation, Sister Rosemary turned around to us and said, Boys and girls, we're not sure what Jesus looked like, but we know he probably looked more like you than like me, unquote. And she walked out of the room. 
She went and changed that crucifix in all 20 classrooms. Not the janitor or a teacher. Sister Rosemary, the principal, did it herself. And she did it when and where all the kids and staff could see. And this is why this matters. This is why how we answer the question, who do you say that I am, matters. It's because of what of Glinton says next. Quote, when you're a fourth grader, everything is bigger than you. Everyone is smarter than you older. And when one day you realize that Jesus is just like you, Jesus is black, then everything short of Jesus seems possible. Sister Rosemary knew exactly how God should look in my eyes. And luckily enough for me, she was able to show me." Unquote. Jesus asks us again today, who do you say that I am? Or better yet, who do you see that I am? Close your eyes and imagine that Jesus is in front of you. This time I invite you to bring to mind any of these new images of Jesus you've seen. Maybe imagine a group of people who feel scary or unfamiliar. Now imagine Jesus as one of those people looking at you lovingly through blue or hazel or brown eyes. Brothers and sisters, each and every single human bears the sacred image of God and therefore, Jesus looks like each and every single human. That is what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the whole world. Now, let us pray. Jesus, open our eyes to see you in the people who don't look like us, because that's where you are and who you are. Help us to cherish your sacred image in others through our words and actions. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we live in a time of great uncertainty and confusion with competing voices and seemingly urgent issues all around. Please help us remember that you are our Lord and Savior, and it's through our faith in you that we have hope and meaning in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, give us confidence to spread your good news to the broader community through the many opportunities you call us to serve. Help us to live out your commandment to love others as you love us, regardless of race, economic conditions, or political points of view. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, while we continue to be a part as a broader church community, you have shown us blessings small and large as we live closer to home and our immediate families, whether it's more time with our kids, our significant other, extended family, this beautiful world you've blessed us with, or simply some quiet self-reflection alone, help us to see these gifts as signs of your love for us and hope for a brighter future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, as the summer season draws to a close and we embark on a fall unlike any other, let us give thanks to those who support us, including our church staff, our teachers, our daycare providers, our first responders, and our frontline medical professionals. Let us be ever joyful in what we do have, our family, our friends, and most important of all, a faith in a loving and compassionate God. Amen. Such a way that's no end. Be 
are love, we are one, we are how we treat each other when the day is done, we are peace, we are war, we are how we treat each other and nothing more. To be bold, to be brave, it is a thinking that the heart can be saved, and the darkness can come quick, dangers in the anger and the hanging on to it, we are love, we are one, we are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace, we are war, we are how we treat each other and nothing more. Tell me what it is that you see, a world that's full of endless possibility. Heroes don't look like they used to, they look like you do. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>